Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to Topic 3.7.4, Populations and Ecosystems from the AQA A-Level Biology Specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. We should know that populations of different species form a community. A community and the non-living components of its environment together form an ecosystem. We should know that ecosystems can range in size from the very small to the very large. Within a habitat, a species occupies a niche governed by adaptation to both abiotic and biotic conditions. We then need to know about the carrying capacity and how the carrying capacity is dictated by the effect of abiotic factors as well as the interactions between organisms, which includes interspecific and intraspecific competition and predation. Then we should also know how to estimate the size of a population using randomly placed quadrats or quadrats along a belt transect for slow-moving or non-motile organisms or we can use the mark release recapture method for motile organisms. We should also know the assumptions made when using the mark release recapture method. We should also know that ecosystems are dynamic systems. We will cover succession, including primary succession, from colonization by pioneer species to climax community, and how at each stage in succession, certain species change the environment so that it becomes more suitable for other species with different adaptations. The new species may change the environment in such a way that it becomes less suitable for the previous species. We should also know that changes that organisms produce in their abiotic environment can result in a less hostile environment and change biodiversity. Finally, we will cover conservation of habitats and how it involves management of succession. So let's make a start. A community is populations of different species in a habitat. An ecosystem is a community and the non-living components of its environment. An ecosystem may be small, such as a pond, or large, such as the sea. A niche is a species role within an ecosystem. This is governed by its adaptation to both biotic and abiotic conditions. Only one species can occupy a niche at a given time. If two species try to occupy the same niche, they will compete with each other. If there is less competition, we have broader niches. Note that abiotic features are the non-living features of an ecosystem and biotic features are the living features of an ecosystem. Next we need to know about something known as the carrying capacity. This is the maximum stable population size of a species that an ecosystem can support. The carrying capacity depends on a number of factors. First of all, the effect of abiotic factors such as light intensity, water availability, food availability, soil pH and temperature. If conditions are favourable, this increases the chances of survival and reproduction, increasing the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity also depends on interactions between organisms, which includes inter- and intraspecific competition. Interspecific competition is when organisms of different species compete for resources. Interspecific competition means that there are less resources available to both species, decreasing the population size as there is less chance of survival and reproduction. If one species is better adapted, it will have increased chance of survival and reproduction and may outcompete the other species. Intraspecific competition is when organisms of the same species compete with each other for resources. Here we have a graph which shows how population size can vary due to intraspecific competition. At first, we have a large population. However, a larger population means that we have increased demand for food, meaning that we have increased intraspecific competition. There is less food available to each individual in the population. Each individual therefore has a lower chance of surviving and reproducing, so the population size decreases. As population size decreases, we in turn have more food available to each individual in the population. There is an increased chance of survival and reproduction, and so the population size increases again. As the population size increases again, we have less resources available to each individual, and the cycle repeats itself. Finally, predation also affects the carrying capacity. Predation is when one organism eats another. Here on the graph we can see that as the population size of the prey increases, we have more food for the predators, so the population size of the predators also increases. However, as the population of the predators increases, more prey are eaten, and so the population of prey decreases. As the population of prey decreases, there is less food available for the predators, so the population size of predators decreases as well. As the population size of the predators decreases, more of the prey survive because they are less predated. Therefore, the population size of the prey increases again and the cycle restarts. 
Note that predator-prey relationships may however be influenced by other factors, such as food availability for the prey, or they may be more complex if the predator feeds on more than one species, for example. Next, we need to know how we can estimate population sizes. Methods vary depending if the organisms are non-motile or slow-moving, or motile. If the organisms are non-motile or slow-moving, we can use randomly placed quadrats. They should be random to avoid bias. First of all, we can plot coordinates and use a random number generator to generate random coordinates. Then we place a 1 meter by 1 meter quadrat and count the number of individuals. Repeat this many times. Then we calculate the mean number of individuals per meter squared by adding the total number of individuals counted and dividing by the number of samples. Then we multiply the mean number of individuals per square meter by the total area. This should give us an estimate of the number of individuals in the population. Note that you could also be measuring percentage cover or frequency of occurrence, i.e. how often do we have a sample where at least one individual of that species is present. For non-motile or slow-moving organisms, we could also use quadrats along a belt transect. Belt transects are used to measure gradual changes in population size across an area. When doing a belt transect, we take samples at regular intervals along a transect. Note that for both methods involving quadrats, the more samples you take, the more reliable the average, as it will reduce the effect of outliers. It will also allow you to identify outliers. We also need to know how to estimate population sizes of motile organisms. The method used is known as the mark release recapture method. First of all, we capture a sample of individuals from the population. For insects, for example, this could be done using pitfall traps. Next, we count the number of individuals and mark them in a harmless way. Then we release them and allow time for them to distribute evenly amongst the rest of the population. Then we capture a second sample from the population. We count the number of individuals caught as well as those marked. We then calculate a population estimate using this formula. Population size equals S1 times S2 divided by R, where S1 is the number of individuals caught in the first sample, S2 the number of individuals caught in the second sample, and R is the number marked in the second sample. Note that for the mark release recapture method, we assume the following criteria are met. We assume that marking doesn't affect survival, such as making individuals more visible to predators. And we also assume that marked individuals mix randomly and evenly with the population. We assume that there is no change in population size due to factors such as births, deaths, immigration or emigration, and we assume that the marking is not lost. Finally, we need to cover succession. Primary succession occurs on land that has newly formed or been exposed, such as cooled lava or exposed rocks after a drop in sea level. First of all, we have pioneer species, which live in areas where we have extreme abiotic conditions. Conditions are very hostile. There are little nutrients available, there is an unstable substrate, little water is available and land is exposed. They have adaptations which allow them to live in these conditions. Adaptations include the ability to reproduce asexually, so they don't need to be pollinated. They may be able to fix nitrogen gas, they may be salt tolerant, and or germinate rapidly, which reduces the likelihood of seeds being blown or washed away. Pioneer species change the environment to make abiotic conditions less hostile. For example, they may erode the rock, and this releases minerals. They add more humus and increase nitrate content when they die and decompose. The new species may then change the environment, so it becomes less suitable for the previous species. Conditions become less hostile. Then succession continues. Conditions become less hostile, and different organisms that are better adapted to the improved conditions outcompete those already there and dominate the ecosystem. More species move in, which increases the biodiversity. Finally, we reach our climax community. This is the largest and most complex community. Mammals and birds are only found in later stages of succession, as biomass of plants is not great enough to provide sufficient food. They also need shelter and protection. Which species make up the climax community depends on the climate. Features of a climax community include that the same species is present over a long period of time. We have a stable community and a stable population. Abiotic factors are constant. Note, however, that the highest biodiversity is reached before our climax community. That was primary succession. We also have secondary succession. In secondary succession, the climax community is cleared in some way, for example, because of a forest fire or agricultural purposes. Succession has to restart. However, succession occurs much quicker, as there's already soil which contains seeds and nutrients to start a new community. 
pioneer species are larger plants. Therefore, a climax community is reached much faster as you're not starting with extreme hostile conditions. Finally, we need to consider conservation. This involves managing succession. We prevent succession from continuing to preserve an ecosystem in its current stage of succession. This is because if another species arrived and dominated, existing species would be outcompeted and die out. So how do we conserve? First of all, we have grazing and mowing. This removes growing tips from plants such as tree saplings or small shrubs. These are prevented from developing, meaning that no climax community is reached. It can also be done through managed fires. In managed fires, all species are wiped out and secondary succession will occur. Small species are pioneer species and grow more quickly than larger trees or shrubs. Great, that would be populations in ecosystems covered. We have covered the definitions of community and ecosystem and how ecosystems can range in size from the very small to the very large. We have covered how in a habitat, a species occupies a niche that is governed by adaptations to both biotic and abiotic conditions. We have covered what a carrying capacity is and how this can vary as a result of the effect of abiotic factors as well as interspecific and intraspecific competition and predation. We have also covered how population sizes of non-motile and slow-moving organisms, as well as motile organisms, can be estimated via randomly placed quadrats, quadrats along a belt transect, and the mark release recapture method, and the assumptions made when using this method. We have covered how ecosystems are dynamic systems, and the various stages involved in primary succession, from colonisation by pioneer species to a climax community, and how the environment may be changed, become less hostile, and how biodiversity may change in the process. And finally, we have covered conservation. That would be it for now guys, thanks for watching, please subscribe, comment, next time we'll be moving on to the control of gene expression, of which the first topic will be the alteration of the sequence of bases in DNA and how it can alter the structure of proteins.